seconds left in overtime. Johnny Rogers caught a pass in the Toronto Argonauts end zone, giving the Montreal Alouettes a 32-10 lead in their Eastern Conference playoff game. An elated Rogers then threw the ball into the crowd. When the sides then lined up for the conversion attempt, officials discovered that there was no ball to kick. Rogers had discarded the last of six balls allocated for the game, and the contest was then called. No more balls. <laughs> what a great moment. You've seen guys. Have you ever seen guys in the pro football do that? You know, in the, the whole big scene when they, when they get all excited and they throw the ball into the stands? <laughs> what, what a... Uh, you know, I, I once saw, though, let me tell you, though, don't laugh. I once saw that actually happen. For those of you who are who are into uh, pro football or sports at all, I actually saw that happen one time. And I was a kid, and I was out at Soldier's Field with the old man, and he was a fantastic Chicago Bears fan. And the Chicago Bears in those days had a really good football team which uh, is going to surprise a lot of you. <laughs> they did. They, had a, they, they were called the Monsters of the Midway, right? And they really were. They were monsters. They had a fantastic football team. Well, it was, a, it was a cold, sleety, rainy Sunday afternoon. They played in the, in the afternoon in Soldier's Field. Now, Soldier's Field is on the Chicago lakefront, which is very cold. I mean... Oh, fantastic wind blowing in off the lake all the time. And this stadium is a classical stadium. It looks like a great Greek arena. If you've ever seen it on TV, you might you might see it once in a while when you see the uh, the college all stars game is always played in Soldiers Field. Well, it's a gigantic arena that seats a, well something like a hundred thousand. I think a hundred point five hundred hundred and five thousand people can get into that into that the fantastic stadium. That's yeah, a tremendous stadium. And it's it's U-shaped. It's like a big magnet. One end is closed, and the other end sort of opens up. And uh, it's a fantastic crowd there. So we're sitting in the middle of the crowd, way the hell up, uh, about 12,000 miles above the field, looking down into the sleet. And the sleet is coming down, and the rain, and the snow, and the wind is blowing. And these Chicago Bear fans are fanatic. I mean, they're wild. Uh, they're, they're yelling and hollering, and the Bears were playing their traditional rivals, Green Bay. Now, this game uh, rivals, uh, it, it, it must, uh, must rival the old games they used to have in New York between the Dodgers and the Giants. I mean, there was no love lost between Green Bay, which, which is only a few miles north of Chicago, and the Chicago Bears. They really fought it out. And these two teams were at their absolute peak. Green Bay was a great club. And the old man had gotten a, had gotten a seat for himself and for me uh, by, by uh, you know, fantastic struggling. We were out there sitting there. It was the big event of the year. And the only game that he ever, that that year, he was able to get a ticket for and actually see in person. So we're sitting, and it's a terrible seat, I want to tell you. We're up in the U portion the part that's closed, which is really in an end zone. Uh, you know, it's, it's at the end zone. The field runs lengthwise inside of this big U, and we're sitting way at the top of the U part. If you can imagine this thing is U-shaped. We're sitting at the top of the curve of the U. And we were so high, we were so high in the stands that by looking over the back, we could see over the back of the stands, and we were looking down at skyscrapers. I mean, that's how high we were. We could see little tiny dots going down the streets down there below, and they were cars. <laughs> the wind is blowing, and it's just really, really fantastic. And the old man had won on a punch board. Uh, did you ever win anything on a punch board? Well, the old man only once in his life won something on a punch board. He used to go down to George's uh, bowling alley, and they had a punch board in George's bowling alley. This is where his uh, bowling team bowled every Wednesday night. And they always had this punch board. St. George always says, oh, hey, uh, you guys like a chance on a punch board? And uh, they had this little metal thing. You ever see punch points? A little metal thing with a little punch on it. And you just take this little, if you've never worked a punch board, you have to have it explained how, how it works. It's a little board about, uh, 
Oh, I'd say about a foot square, roughly, and it's all different colors, red, green, yellow. It says, pick the, the name of your favorite girl on it, and it had all these names, see, like Marie, uh, Dorothy, Myrtle, and little punch holes. And you take this little punch thing and you stick it in, and out comes a little piece of paper on the back, which you pull out, and it's all folded up. And you open it up, and it's got a number on it. Now, some of the numbers were in red, some of them were in green. And after every number, long number, there would be a little diamond or a heart or a spade or a club. So the old man won one, one historic moment. The only time he ever won anything in his life, at George's punch board, he pushed in the punch, and he got under the name of Dorothy, which, incidentally, my mother always wondered who the hell he knew was named Dorothy. <laughs> he never said. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was always betting on things named Dorothy. Like if, if he went to the racetrack and there was a horse named Dorothy K running, he would bet on that horse. And my mother always would say, well, who is Dorothy? He said, I, I don't know, I just, uh, I got a hunch. There must have been some fantastic Dorothy in his life. And uh, he, he plugged on the thing under Dorothy, and out came this piece of paper. I was with him when, it, when this happened. Uh, you know, luckily, I was present at this historic moment, and he unfolds the thing, and there's a long number, like 174960D with a heart after it. And they, they had a list of winning numbers that George had. Do you remember the list? They had a list of winning numbers. And George is looking down. He's, I'll be damned. You won the binoculars. The old man says, what? He says, yeah, you won the binoculars. Hey, hey, Zeke. Hey, Shepard won the binoculars here. The old man is flipping. And, and they, <laughs> they, they have to open up the case where they kept all the cigars and all that, where they had the prizes like the box of candy in the shape of a heart. That was another one of the prizes. Like the uh, stuffed panda that uh, was to be used as a pin cushion. You know, all these great useful prizes. And the old man won the second top prize. Now, the first prize was a radio which the old man needed, like, you know, like a third foot on the top of his head. The house was filled with radios. But he won a set of, of binoculars. Now, they came in this, this uh, leather case. <laughs> and from that minute on, they were kept in a, in, a, in a special place where the old man kept all his important stuff, like his camera. He kept it. Uh, he I had another thing that was, was one of his uh, prize uh, pieces of gear, was a tire gauge. My old man was very proud of his tire gauge. He had a, <laughs> you know, the kind with a long chromium tube, and he, it came in a, in a leather case. And, uh, yes, and it even had a clip where you could carry it in your, in your, uh, in your pocket, like a, like a fountain pen, see? And he used to just walk around testing guys' tires, you know? <laughs> oh, yes, I have my tire gauge. Oh, sure, me, I'll test your tires. And he loved this tire gauge. Well, he also loved this set of binoculars, which nobody was allowed to touch. I imagine the retail value of this set of binoculars was probably well over $4. But, uh, you know, they, they, were his, <laughs> they were his great binoculars. I can tell you one thing. Every time you looked through them, uh, you, your left eye began to hurt because your left eye was in focus and your right eye was, was out of focus. And then if you adjusted the thing, your right eye would come in focus and your left eye would go out of focus. Now, it didn't matter. So we're sitting way to hell up in, in Soldier's Field. <laughs> and it's a fantastic game. And the old man is sitting up there with his binoculars, see? And he's looking down, watching the struggle, the titanic battle between the mighty Packers and the monarchs, the monsters of the midway. And they're battling it out. And once in a while you'd hear great roars coming from the crowd down below us who could see the game. Uh, <laughs> but the fog had settled in. And that was another thing. See, fog would come in from, from the lakefront. The fog had slowly settled down there. And you could just see these dim figures way down below you running around scurrying and uh, you'd hear, you'd hear uh, an occasional roar of the crowd, and you could actually hear the sound of the football pads hitting each other. You'd hear the sound, you'd, you'd, hear, the you'd hear the sound of these great lions crashing into each other, and once in a while you'd hear the sound of a punt, you know, thunk. and 
the ball would come right out of the fog. You'd see the ball rising out of, you know, it was going above uh, the ceiling, you know, just like a plane breaking through the clouds. The ball would rise out of the fog and then go back into the fog. <laughs> you never saw it run back. So we're, <laughs> we're sitting up there, but who, you know, who cares? You're at the game, you know, these guys are yelling and hollering and drinking and, and cheering. And somebody had a portable radio next to us, and he's listening to the game, so you could actually hear what's going on down there. And here it is, late in the fourth quarter, to score Chicago Bears 14, Packers 6, right? At that point, somebody on the Packers kicked the field goal at the other end of the field. Now, they had these, you know, goal posts. The guys kicked these field goals. Man, they pow, you know, they kick them right over there. And the ball goes into the stands. Well, everybody sitting around us, we're, we're, you know, they're all hollering. Kick one down here, man. Oh, I'd love to get one of the balls. Oh, wow, you know. The whole idea of many fans when they go to any kind of a game is to get a foul ball <laughs> or, to, or to have a ball kicked into the stands. Well, see, we're sitting at the other end. Now, we're, we're down at the... At the, at the other end of the field. Well, at the quarter, they changed sides. Now going into the last quarter. So now you, wait, you got the score, right? 14 to 9. And it is a titanic battle. And they're going back and forth between the 30-yard lines, these two teams. Guys are throwing passes in the murk, and we'd hear the crowd roar. And you'd hear these hard tackles. It's if Chicago Bears and the Packers Six minutes to play. Some guy on the Packers breaks one. Man, he broke one. He's down around the 20-yard line, way at the other end of the field. He broke an off-tackle slant, and he is through the secondary and gone. And the people are going eight. And, of course, the entire stands is divided between two groups of people, the Packer fans and the Bear fans. And there is no love loss. No love. I mean, oh, oh, this is, <laughs> I mean, real. And anyway, this Packer player breaks it. And you know the Packer uniforms. You've seen them. The big yellow helmet, you know. Yeah, And we could see that yellow helmet go through the Bears' helmets. Now, the Bears' helmets are black. You've seen the Bears' helmets black with the stripe down, the, you know, big C. And he breaks through, and he is going down over the 50 yard. He's down to the 45-yard line, down to the 20-yard line. He's down to the 15, down to the 10, down to the 5. He's over for a touchdown. And the crowd roars. At that point, he takes the ball, and he just flings it up into the stands. And it almost got up to where we were. It was, it, see, we were in the end zone. He threw the ball up like that, and it just sailed right up into the stands. About 16,000 guys are fighting over it, and they're down below it. And if you've ever seen real pro football fans fighting over a $25 ball, man, they, it, it gets violent. Have you ever seen it, Joe? I mean, you could get your head busted. And these guys are wrestling and fighting and yelling, and finally the crowd settles down, and I don't know what the hell happened at that point, because they all settle down, and the, 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 football, the, the, the football players go back out, they change teams, on comes the, the kickoff team, and the Chicago Bears are now trailing. One touchdown. Let's see, the score was about 15 to 14, 16 to 14, something like that. And with about five minutes to go, desperate scene. And the Chicago Bears, by the way, had a fan, famous, really a very famous field goal kicker. And, they, and, and everyone was hoping for a field goal. See, so the Bears go to line up they're going to receive, right? They're lined up below us. The Packers are down at the other end, and they're going to kick off. And there's a little conference going on. Everybody up, upstairs there where we were sitting, everybody thought it was some kind of an offsides or something, you know. They're, when all of a sudden the PA system announces, Well, a person who caught the football in the end zone, please return the football. Please return the football. And the crowd booed. <laughs> that was a great uproar. They booed like hell. Well, I was actually present when they ran out of footballs. Now, that's hard to believe, but... But this, the, on this day, they had no more footballs. And the announcer kept saying, Well, the person who caught the football in the northern end zone, please return the ball. We must continue the game. 
And at that point, boom, everybody yells. Because it is, an, it is a matter of principle never to return a football that is kicked into the stands. This is a, this is a deeply held principle. Do you agree? Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, you mean you don't agree? Can you imagine? Why? Uh, can you imagine being asked to return a foul ball at Shea Stadium? You can't imagine it? Yes, at Shea you can. That's a cheap outfit. That's true. <laughs> Speak. Uh, this is WOR New York. At the, please hit the money button, please. I'm Richard Adler co-producer, co-composer lyricist of the new musical production, The Pajama Game, now at the Lunt Fontan Theater. The world's greatest magicians perform at the World Festival of Magic and the Occult, the weirdest show on earth. An unforgettable experience. Bring the whole family to can hold each other's land. The World Festival of Magic and the Occult, the weirdest show on earth. Wednesday, December 12th through Sunday, December 30th at the Felt Forum in Madison Square Garden Center. For ticket information, call 212-564-4400. Tickets also at Ticketron. Oh, yeah, you know, you can't beat reality, I'll tell you. Oh, no. You know what they did? I mean, uh, of course, I, I must say, if, if, if what you say is true, that uh, the Jet fans are often asked to return footballs, they are not the same breed of cat then. A Chicago Bear fan would he would no more think of uh, of uh, returning a football than selling his grandmother into slavery. I mean that is a matter of principle, and uh, <laughs> you that and and of course the fans are on the fan side. Remember this: there's no way, uh, no way you're going to find a, a fan cheering an official coming over and asking for the football back. No way. So uh, the, the officials came over, and they were talking about it, and they couldn't find a guy that had the ball. Oh, well, no, he was sitting in there, obviously had it stuck under his coat or something, but you would never find any fan would think on him. Uh, no way. I mean, he won it in fair combat. If they're going to kick the ball in the stands, they got to take the consequences, right? So <laughs> they kept announcing, would you please return the ball? And every time they would do it, the booze would get louder. And so the, the wind is blowing, it's getting colder and colder. They actually took a 15-minute time out when the officials left the, left the stadium, actually left the stadium, and went to the sporting goods store where they could get some footballs. Or wherever they got them. <laughs> they were gone 15 minutes, and they brought back a new supply of footballs. And, uh, you know, what a, what a great moment. But... Uh, but I saw a scene one time, uh, you know, you just can't, you, uh, speaking of, uh, of people not returning things, uh, I, I, uh, I saw at the Struggling with Racetrack one time, I saw a wheel come off of a race car, and it bounced twice over the race course, you know, just bounced twice over the road, hopped over the fence, it's rubber, you know, just boop, 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 hopped over the fence, and bounced twice and landed in the stands, well, the stands were only half empty, you know, they're half filled, and it didn't hurt anybody. The, the, the wheel landed in this, this uh, open place over there. Three guys grabbed it and ran right out with the wheel. <laughs> they ran like hell with the wheel. Well, uh, you know, this, uh, we're all basically scavengers at heart, let's face it. I mean, uh, how many times do you walk down the street and uh, you're walking along and there's a big pile of garbage overflowing out of the street? Do you ever take a sidelong glance at that stuff to see whether there might be something unbelievably groovy resting in the middle of all that stuff? Of course you don't. Naturally. Of course you don't. Uh, everybody here is excluded from all these evil habits. And we understand that. Speaking of evil habits, I, I like to see the reality that's beginning to come into our world. Uh, I received, you know, I get a lot of junk mail. And I received a, uh, a little letter here the other day, big fat one, actually. It says, wonderful gift suggestions for the executive or the person, just the walking around individual with an imagination who has everything. And uh, I'd like to show you what the newest the development of our time is. Encounter dolls. Well, you've heard of encounter sessions, haven't you, where people sit around and feel each other, right? Uh, they used to call them orgies. 
Uh, but uh, now, <laughs> encounter sessions. <laughs> and uh, you can now buy encounter dolls. And uh, these are wonderful. It says encounter dolls. There's pictures of them. And underneath it, it says people substitutes. Now, if you out there are one of these uh, uh, idealistic, wonderful, uh, romantic people who believe that peace is possible in the world, and this is a curse of mankind. He's always felt that uh, if somehow we could get all of the current troubles over, that peace would settle down and everyone would take up uh, finger painting, uh, guys would join uh, uh, little theater groups, uh, old ladies would take up writing poetry, there would be universal guitar playing, and uh, peace would settle down, whatever, you know, peace would be universal, right? Well... I suggest that uh, this new product maybe tells the truth about uh, about mankind. It says people substitutes, lightweight, resilient, or soft foam. You can have your choice. Perfect when a client is working out feelings about someone who is not there. Did you hear what I said? Perfect for a client who is working out feelings about someone who is not there. You can modify them for each client. Plain white surface on resilient foam is easily marked with a water-based felt-tip pen. Names, faces, or anything else can be drawn and then removed with soap and water. Now, what do you do with these uh, encounter people substitutes? Would you get with them a collection of darts that you throw at them? So these are very necessary psychological augmentation devices for today's world. You can even cement or tape on a photo of a place, or you can dress them in children's clothes for added realism. I mean, if you secretly hate your kids, you can get one of these encounter people, dress them in your kids' clothes, draw the kid's face on it, and throw darts at it. Now, you could never get them. <laughs> I'm sorry, Joe. Let's face it. Many people do hate their kids. Many kids hate their parents. Let's be honest. That's right. Uh, they are great targets for the darts which come with these encounter doll people substitutes. Now, you can also get for them, in the name of reality, of course, uh, you can get foam, foam rubber representations of uh, sexual organs which attach to these. Okay? Now, wait a minute, friends. Think seriously about that. <laughs> Not that it makes any difference. But the, this, this uh, you know, the Japanese of long ago, uh, they're very realistic people, the Japanese. You know, the Japanese have in every, in every uh, workplace, like uh, the Mitsubishi plant, the Panasonic plant, uh, the Hitachi plant, the uh, Toyota plant. Uh, the Japanese have a, a a period in every worker's day, like we have a coffee break, they have a hate break. Did you know that, Joe? Well, every plant has a room where when an employee is fed up. Now, you have been fed up many times in your job, right? How many times have you said, I have had it up to here! To hell with this place! And then you sit for a while and they pour water on your head and in comes Eddie and he says, now come on, calm down. It's Herb's turn next week to get the business. Now you, you'll be all right. You say, well, yeah, but for God's sakes, I've been here 107 years and they put me on the 2 a.m. to the 7 a.m. shift and not only that. Well, how many times has this happened in life? But the Americans don't take cognizance of the reality of this problem, that most people go around in their lives vaguely mad, most of the time. Now, would you buy that, Jerry? Not you. No, I don't think you do. I don't think you do, Jerry. You're, you're, uh, you're, uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you're basically, you would not need this service, but there are some people among us who are the placid ones. And they, they simply aren't mad most of the time. But most people are, are mad a good deal of the time. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Do you know that you can buy, you can buy now at Abercrombie & Fitch, you can buy teakwood chips for your shoulder. Yes, I mean, these are elegant chips. Oh, you have the plain old, old ordinary old-fashioned pine chip on your shoulder? Let me see. Well, you can get some elegant chips now. You can buy teakwood, walnut. Yes, they're expensive, of course, but they're worth it. If a guy knocks your chip off your shoulder and it's a beautiful piece of rubbed ebony, uh, he's knocking an elegant chip off of his shoulder. At that point, uh, almost anything can follow. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> yeah, well, you know that on certain uh, work jackets now, you know, uh, suits for wearing to work, there's a little clip that you can put your, ch your chip on so that it doesn't fall off when you're drinking your coffee at the coffee break. You know, it has to be knocked off. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the, 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 the feeling of universal anger, uh, anger is always with us. So the Japanese have uh, taken this into account in their life, in their everyday life. And they have a hate room where the Japanese worker, instead of taking his tea break, he uh, says to, uh, to uh, Fujiyama or Hosaki or whoever his foreman is, Oh, Saki, I go to go to hate room. He goes down to the hate room, and he's got five minutes, and he walks in there, and they have these big life-size dolls in there that are made in the shape of the bosses. Actually, they're real representation. Now, you are, <laughs> I'm not kidding you. They're, they're representation, though. So here is his boss, uh, Hotsaki. There he stands down there. He's made out of plastic, polyethylene or some kind of a plastic material. And uh, in comes, uh, in comes uh, uh, the worker. He walks in, and there's an attendant who's in charge there. He says, oh, I cannot stand Hotachi. I'm so mad, Hotachi. He give me nothing but trouble. He says, ah, ah so, ah, so. He reaches out there, and he is given a set of cheap dinnerware. Real cheap. And by the way, the union provides all this. He is he's presented with a, a set of cheap dinnerware, which he then hurls at the copy of his boss, the, the representation. And he can say anything he wants. It's a soundproof room. So the boss doesn't hear what, the, you know, what the, he really thinks about him. Uh, he can just throw this stuff, you know, little, uh, little Watanabe is uh, throwing these pieces of plate at his boss, Hotaki. See, he says, Hotaki, you fake! Bam! He slams it up. Hotaki, you, bu you bubble! And he throws it out and once he crash. Well, after five minutes of this, he feels good. And uh, he's had his hate period. He's broken all the crockery. And the attendant starts sweeping it up. And he goes back out on the assembly line singing an old Japanese folk song about peace and love. And, uh, <laughs> and they, they, now you think I'm making this up. This is the truth. They do. Now, I see that eventually, eventually, uh, I can see this. I can see this in many organizations. Now, uh... Uh, I, I think, though, that in the American scheme, it would be not your fellow worker that you would see in the hate room. It would probably be clients. I'll tell you. <laughs> I <laughs> salesmen in television and in radio and in various other fields after an afternoon with a particularly obtuse, obnoxious client come back seven years older uh, with with great bags under his eyes, walk into the office. Oh, that! Oh my God! If I have to talk to that idiot, he spent seven hundred million dollars a year on a station, and that guy has got—he's got a mind like a like a turtle. And he's got the brain of a chipmunk. And if I have to listen to that damn wife of his once more, well now. Couldn't it be kind of great if we could have the clients? You could have a, you know, you could have a, a statue that looks like J.B. Bullard of, <laughs> of the beer company, and you could sit there and throw darts and shoot arrows at them. But uh, all of this stuff, uh, you know, the, the reality of our time, hate is uh, is uh, almost universal. Oh yes, uh, I uh, you particularly find it in uh, in uh, in the symbolic sense, sports. Uh, Met fans hate Yankee fans in a curious, symbolic way. Not actually, but uh, they do. 
uh, I think this is a great value of sports, is that it kind of gets clears the scene. Uh, so if, uh, if, let's say, the Green Bay Packers are being ground under heel by the Chicago Bears, the Chicago people feel better. No, no, the Green Bay Packer people don't. But then they always figure next year we'll kill them. Like the next war, we're going to get them. You know? So I, I uh, but it, it rarely, it rarely comes down into the actual playing field. Except occasionally it does. You ever play football, Joe? Real football. Organized. Uh-huh. You, Jerry? You play high school or college ball? At all? All right. Have you ever played in a game where hate began to show? Indeed. Uh, indeed. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't mean just anger. I mean where it carried over from year to year and began to get pretty damn serious. Well, it got so serious recently, if, you're, if you follow uh, the the history of hate in America, or uh, this is a world problem. Don't think it's American. Uh, I think the cheapest thing that a writer can do is to pretend that bias and prejudice and so forth, hate and so on, is an American property. No way, friend. Uh, if you've ever been to a, let's say, a soccer game, what they call football, in Glasgow when they're playing Edinburgh, good God almighty. <laughs> I mean, it's not uncommon for 37 spectators to be taken to the hospital with uh, serious injuries just from smacking each other in the mouth. Uh, that's, a, that's the truth. So I, I, uh, I <laughs> you know, hate this uh, is, uh, in, uh, in, in the sports sense. But I remember one time uh, a scene where, where hate began to grow slowly. In fact, uh, it, it just happened recently out in the, in the Midwest that after a football game the, between two traditional rivals, the tension had grown so bad, uh, the feelings were so high, that after the game, when the ball players came out of the dressing room, the, the team bus was sitting out there, and uh, they, they, they had police and everything else there to get the, to get the ball players out. They were playing away from home, of course. Uh, the team that was playing away from home had won the game, which is a terrible thing to do. They had won the game, and so they wound up getting police out there. They had a whole crowd of police. And, and in spite of the police, the quarterback was shot twice by guys in the crowd. Now, did you hear about that? Huh? As a matter of fact, he died. Now, that, that's a little story that, uh, <laughs> that uh, not many people talk about. But, you know, recently in, uh, in a foreign, uh, yes, in a foreign soccer game, I believe it was, uh, I believe it was in uh, France, I believe. It might have been uh, Belgium, one of those countries on, in mid-Europe, that uh, in the middle of a, a soccer game, the feelings got so high that fans began to pour down out of the field, into the end of the field, and were fighting the players uh, from the other team who were beating their team. And uh, they cleared the stands, and finally, again, they poured down, and on the second time, four of the players were stabbed. <laughs> One player was shot. Uh, they wound up by putting practically the entire stands in jail. I mean, you know, 2,000 people were taken and put in a slam. But uh, this, uh, you know, this, this is the way it goes. I saw I saw a guy one time. <laughs> you talk about curious inverted uh, uh, madness, which comes from satirical things. I, a lot of it comes from from a sense of satire, a lot of pure hate. Uh, I was I was present when one time Santa Claus, uh, sitting in, in in a department store, and this was a friend of mine was playing Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Is sitting at uh, on this uh, chair there, and uh, all the kids are all lined up. And these kids were coming up and asking him for stuff. You know, yeah, Santa Claus. Did you ever? Did you ever ask Santa Claus for anything ever in your life? Well, now some kids did, and others didn't. Uh, this this split right down the middle. And you know, a lot of people tend to think that stuff is all over. That kids don't ask Santa Claus. 
Well, I was in a department store last Christmas in Philadelphia uh, when the manager of the store, it was Wanamaker, as a matter of fact, the manager of the store took me up there to show me the scene. He says, you know, he says, you can't understand uh, the, the writing that's often written about things that are happening in America. He says, it must come out of the writer's head. It doesn't come out of reality. He said that, that there had been a big piece that said that Santa Claus is no longer as popular as Santa Claus was. And large numbers of kids don't believe in this. He says, I don't know where to get that. He says that our Santa Claus here, <laughs> there are more kids today standing in line at the Santa Claus. And in fact, they had a tremendous labyrinthine setup there. You came through all kinds of labyrinths so that the line wouldn't extend all the way to New Jersey. Uh, they had it all set up so that the kids were all standing in great big circles and whirls and all that. He said that, that, the, that the lines are bigger before Santa Claus today than ever in his memory. And he had been a store manager for over 40 years. Now, how do you make of that? And, uh, I mean, they, they, he says the Santa Claus is, uh, is really big today. Well, I, I had this friend who played a, uh, a Santa Claus in a, in a department store. You know, when you're first getting started in, the, in showbiz, you play a lot of things. And, in fact, you're listening to a guy who played Santa Claus twice himself on television. Yeah, yeah, I played Santa Claus, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was a great scene. Uh, uh, there I was. I was a 19-year-old Santa Claus. And, uh, yeah, oh, yes, sir. Uh, hey, for three weeks, one's friend, and you ain't got no tonsils left. And, of course, Santa Claus is always expected to go ho, ho, ho. He does not come on with a high-pitched giggle. Uh, not, not if he's... <laughs> not if he's... <laughs> That brings up, hey, that brings up another thing. You know, all the various minorities now want their own Santa Clauses, which, you know, you can understand. You have black Santa Claus, you have lady Santa Clauses. I mean, why not? So this friend of mine is sitting up on the chair there. So, you know, they had a big cha uh, Santa Claus throne. And uh, he's sitting up there, and all these kids are lined up before him, thousands of kids. And uh, he was all excited. Of course, it was his first big showbiz, showbiz break playing Santa Claus. And he's sitting up there, and it was in Chicago. In fact, if you're curious where he was Santa Claus, he was in Santa Claus. He was Santa Clausing in a very famous store. Are you aware that there is a uh, a distinct social set of differentiations, a social caste system among Santa Clauses? If you're a Santa Claus in a crummy discount shop, you're nowhere near to Santa Claus if you're sitting in Saks Fifth Avenue. I mean, that is, <laughs> and 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 they get together, you know, they they. Uh, you, you see the Santa Clauses after a hard day being Santa Claus gathering in various, you know, taverns and stuff. And, uh, and uh, you, you find that the Santa Claus that's always holding forth, it's like the patriarch Santa Claus, the top Santa Claus, is the one that works in Macy's. That's big time. Uh, the, the Bloomingdale Santa Claus, that's a biggie. Uh, certainly Saks Fifth Avenue. He's an elegant Santa Claus. So Saks Fifth Avenue Santa Claus, of course, has... Uh, well, where's a slightly different? Uh, he has a Santa Claus costume designed by Bill Blass. Uh, it's a very elegant Santa Claus, and uh, each one has his own little <laughs> his own little place in the in the scheme of things. And my friend had started out in this is his second year of Santa Claus, and he started out in a fairly large department store in Chicago, and the second year he got a, a shot at the big time, uh, Marshall Fields. That's the big time in Chicago. Marshall Fields, yes, that's a famous store. And uh, they have very elegant Santa Clauses. Santa Clauses with a, they just exude uh, dignity uh, and, and great presence. And so here he was. He was promoted. And, uh, of course, he was a morning Santa Claus. Now, that's not as important as the afternoon Santa Claus, you know, within the, within the hierarchy, within the actual store. So he's the morning Santa Claus. Now, most of the kids had half-day school and all that, and they'd come in the afternoon. So he's working the morning Santa Claus. 
And I happened to be present when it actually happened. It's, it's, I, I sometimes, I sometimes shrug my shoulders when I'm confronted with my fellow man. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, anyway, Scott was sitting up there. His name was Scott, in case you're interested. Uh, that was uh, not germane to the situation. He actually was Santa Claus. He, he played the role and lived it. So he's sitting up on this golden throne they had made for Santa Claus. And all around him were these little mechanical elves. Now, uh, they could have gotten real elves. I would have thought that a store like, uh, like uh, Marsh Rafia would come, you know, bring the real thing down. But they had mechanical elves, and all these little elves were had hammers, and some of them had saws, and they had sleds they were making in little airplanes. And behind him, you could hear the continual sound of jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. And they, they just played over and over. They had a tape, see. And he was in a grotto. He was in a grotto made of plastic icicles that hung down. He was supposed to be like in the North Pole, you know. And it was all blue light. He really looked great, but it was high up. It was on a high platform. And thousands of kids would come and see him. And all stand in line to see the Santa Claus. The official Santa Claus, who was known in Chicago, was at Macy's. All the others were called Santa's helpers. And all the other stories, this was the real Santa Claus. And his beautiful costume and a beautiful beard. Fantastic false beard. And Scott is sitting up there playing the role to the hilt on this disastrous Saturday morning, two days before Christmas. Now, Saturday, is, as you probably know, is a big day, especially if Saturday falls before Christmas. Millions of people were in the store. And there was a tremendous crowd of mothers, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, floor walkers were on duty. The toy department was packed. Jingle Bells was playing out through the whole thing. You could hear the sound of little electric trains. Hey, by the way, I saw a funny sight the other day. Uh, speaking of electric trains, I went in a store, and they had a little wind-up train. Uh, it wasn't too little. It was, a, it was just like an engine, like a diesel engine. It was about two feet long, but it was, it was, it was made for running on, on, uh, on the rug, not, not for on tracks, and it was wind-up. And it had a, had a whistle that went, ooh, ooh, ooh. Well, somebody had wound up this train and had let it go in the aisle. And it was just going right down the aisle all by itself. And people were, pe people were walking by it, you know, looking. And this thing would go, ooh, ooh. It'd just go past us. And I heard this little old lady say, oh, for heaven's sakes, what's that? She thought it was some kind of a very large mouse. <laughs> and the little train went woo, woo, just went right out past nobody knew whose it was it wasn't even in the toy department it was in the luggage department but my friend Scott is sitting up there being Santa Claus it was about 10 o'clock in the morning thousands of kids were lined up when one kid came up sat on his knee and Scott says the usual and what would you like for Christmas little boy and the kid says, uh, I'd like to shake your hand, Santa. And Santa says, Why, of course, little boy. Anybody, any little boy that would like to shake Santa's hand is a friend of old Santa Claus. Ho, ho, ho. And he takes his hand out, and he had this big mitt, you know, this, he was all made up. The little kid grabs his hand, and Scott went, What the hell is this? And he fell over backward. The kid had a shocking device in his hand. Have you ever seen those things that give you about a 7,000 volt shock? Santa Claus fell over backward among all the mechanical elves that kept, <laughs> that kept hammering away with their little plastic mechanical hammers. And the crowd is in an uproar. A cop came up. Oh, God. Incidentally, Scott has never been quite the same. When Santa Claus gets a shock from a kid that he's offering to give a gift to, Santa Claus ain't the same after that. Scott later became a left-wing agitator, joined several groups that were involved in bombings, 